Shalom. Chag Pesach Sameach. This is the seventh day, the final day of Passover. Traditionally, the focus of the seventh day is on the final redemption. In our Ketuvim Meshachim reading from Sefer Hetagalut 15, Rav Yochanan declares, I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moshe and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. I think we can all agree that natural and man-made calamities are increasing at an astonishing rate. With several years of COVID-19 behind us and Russia's war on the Ukraine continuing, these things and many others are seriously shaking the economies and the social and political complacency and stability of the whole world. In the last few years, thousands have fled the civil conflict in Syria and Iraq, the war ongoing in Yemen. Jihadists have been active in areas with which we are mostly unfamiliar, like the greater Sahi and Lake Chad Basin, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire. Millions have fled Russian militarism in the Ukraine for Poland and other near countries. Other trouble spots include nations which seem more distant and of less concern to us. South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Myanmar. Hurricanes and floods, fires, earthquakes, and, and other natural disasters and erratic weather conditions have increased in number and magnitude, destroying cities, killing hundreds of thousands all over the world. The UN reports more than 17,000 children die of starvation daily. Violence is on the increase. And this is global with wars and rumors of wars and increased anti-Semitic attacks here in the UK, in the USA, in Europe. Economic stress and distress continues to increase as well with oil and gas prices soaring to new heights. The threat to the security of Israel and indeed to Israel's very existence has been increased as the ineffectual president of the United States largely a figurehead in my opinion, has courted the PA and Iran, the leading supporter of terrorism in the world. Despite the accord between Israel and the Emirates and the kind of uh, detente with Saudi Arabia, which, uh, which has surprisingly happened quite recently, Israel's Arab neighbors amass armaments, 
terrorism against Jews continues, and it is largely ignored by the world. Russia declares that Gaza is still part of Syria, their close ally. Uprisings, the destabilization of governments, and the threat of all-out war somewhere. These are constants with threats and boycotts and terrorist attacks almost daily. The so-called Palestinians and their allies all over the world are intent on taking back not only all of Jerusalem, but all of what they call Palestine, by which they mean the whole of the land of Israel, none of which ever belonged to any entity or people group known as the Palestinians, a people who never existed. War, famine, and hunger, hoarding of wealth by the top 1% of the population. All of this has been accentuated by the worldwide pandemic and its aftermath, as many who sink into poverty and indentured servitude strike back or encourage anarchy, global, natural, social, and spiritual disintegration are accelerating and they are rapidly approaching meltdown. The wealthy elite around the world continue to get richer, placing literally trillions of dollars, pounds, and euros in offshore accounts, further eroding the tax base of many nations. Governments continue to bail out big business and banks while the middle classes decline. Trends analysts like Gerald Salente, renowned for the accuracy of his political and economic forecasts, have predicted global disasters such as the Greatest Depression and the Greatest World War. Trend prognosticators are trying to maintain a positive long-range outlook, but they say only those who are prepared economically, whatever that means, will survive. Many want to believe that the financial climate will turn around and that if we work together, human beings can make the world a better, cleaner, greener, safer place for everyone. But correctly forecasting the future is not a matter of idle speculation, of trend analysis, or the correct economic theory. The only source of truth about the future comes from the only one who knows the future, Hashem, the God of Israel. If you want to know what the future holds, you need to know the one who holds the future. More than 2,000 years ago, Rav Yeshua told his Talmudim as recorded in Matthew 24, Marcus 3, 13, Lucas 21, and in his Hittikalut to us, all that we need to know and how we can prepare for what is coming. God wants us to be prepared for the times in which we live. Divrei Hayamim Aleph Chronicles 1232 speaks of those in the past who knew and understood the times. In order to unlock the prophecy of Hittikalut, 
one must understand the whole of God's prophetic word given throughout the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the Tanakh. What do we know about the future from the scriptures? All the signs point to the return of Mashiach in the very near future. We are told to do two things in order to be properly prepared. Rav Shaul writes, Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. If we were not going to experience any hardships, these words would have been completely unnecessary. We are told to watch, to be vigilant and on guard, fully awake, aware, alert, and intently focused on God and his plans. We must be willing to wait in expectancy, to embrace the stillness. This, of course, is not about what you can do, but about what God will do. We must stand firm in our faith in Hashem because he alone is sovereign. Don't focus on the end result. So many people today are focused on trying to figure out this aspect or that aspect of the future. But God says, focus on me and live each day that, that I give you according to my commandments and my halakha. Accept that you can't see the whole picture. So use the time that I give you to mature. Allow me to work in your life. We are warned repeatedly against relying upon the world system, its philosophies and religions. We're told in Hittigalud 18, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. Central to the writings of the prophets, as we saw in the 12, which we studied recently, is God's sovereignty in the affairs of Israel and the nations of the world. This is a denial of man's claim to supremacy over himself and his destiny. The philosophy of humanism, which originated with the Greeks, it is a demonstration that God's gifts and calling upon Israel are irrevocable. Romans eleven twenty nine. In Yechezkel forty eight thirty five, we're told that the new city of God will be called Adonai Shama. The Lord is here. Here, in Jerusalem. We know that God is with his people Israel, both in the land and here in the diaspora. He is sovereign. The future is in his hands, and it is a future filled with hope and assurance for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This message, of course, is not new. It continues throughout the scriptures. Moshe wrote in Devarim, back between 1450 and 1410 BCE, of the discipline to come upon Israel for disobedience. But he also spoke 
of Israel's full reconciliation, restoration, and blessing. Yeshiahu, writing in the 8th century BCE, warned Israel of the results of rebellion against God, but he spoke of God's judgment upon many nations who rejoiced at Israel's destruction and of Israel's restoration and revival. Yermiahu, writing in the 7th century BCE, specifically called Israel to repentance and prophesied Jerusalem's terrible fall. But he also spoke of Israel's return and future hope. Yechezkel's prophecy, again in the 7th century, is even more graphic and clear, more powerful, although veiled. Its specific purpose is to address those who were in exile and to remind those born in the diaspora, like us, of God's righteous justice in his judgment of sin and rebellion. But it stresses God's great mercy in restoring our nation under a righteous king of David's line, Mashiach. These promises confirmed by all of our prophets are filled with hope and assurance, hope for and assurance in the future that God has planned for Israel. In Sefer Hatagalut, we see Israel delivered from the hands of the enemy and restored by God, who is her defender and king, Mashiach Yeshua. We read in Yeshiahu 26, verse 9, With my soul have I desired you in the night. Yes, with my spirit within me I have sought you earnestly. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. This verse speaks of both love for God and a prayer of yearning to the one who is the source of our very existence. It is seen by many within traditional Judaism as the prelude to the final redemption. In a way, it's comparable to the statement, Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai, which will be Israel's call for the return of Mashiach, as Yeshua himself foretold. The spirit God has given each of us yearns to be with him. Even as we are told, the whole of creation groans in longing and anticipation for tukun alam, the restoration of all things. On this earth, we live in a kind of foggy darkness where we have the opportunity to learn of God and draw near to him through his gift of redemption, through Mashiach Yeshua, the promised Mashiach of Israel. In the process, we become aware of our own unworthiness, materialism, and false illusions as we open our eyes to God's creation, we see the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. The precepts of Adonai are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of Adonai are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The reverence of Adonai is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of Adonai are firm 
and all of them together are righteous. <clears throat> as we grow in understanding of his ways, as the light becomes brighter, dispelling the fog and darkness, our longing to be with him increases. God proclaimed his redemption long before we understood it. From the foundation of the universe, human redemption has been made available by God and is a matter of choice for those he created. When we choose to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, his sacrifice for us, we experience his love, his loving kindness, his chesed, and his mercy, his rachamim. But this is only the beginning of our relationship with God, which stretches from the present throughout eternity. Lord, you will establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. O oh Lord, our God, other gods beside you have ruled over us, but your name alone do we honor. Yeshiahu 26. The Mikdash in Jerusalem was our national connection to our Creator, and it will be restored in the end of days to that place of central significance, God's dwelling with us, according to Yechezkel 46. Once again, the Mikdash of God designed not by Shlomo or by Herod, but by God himself, will be filled with his glory. Yechezkel tells us that not only will the temple be rebuilt, but it will be larger and more beautiful than we can even imagine. The Shekinah of God, the presence of God, will return by the eastern gate, just as it left before Babel destroyed the Mikdash, the first Mikdash. Jerusalem will be the seat of King Mashiach's government, and we, the righteous of Israel, will reign with him. The nations of the world will bow to our king, and they will serve him and his people Israel. In that day, we read in Yeshiahu 26, shall this song be sung in the land of Yehuda. We have a strong city, walls and bulwarks did he appoint for redemption. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faithfulness may enter in. This, of course, speaks of Israel. God's ways and attributes are the strong city, the fortress, the wall, and the bulwarks he provides in our present state. But in that day, Israel, the righteous nation of God, will be the bearer of the holiness God desires in the world. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. In this world, our minds are challenged by conflicts with the worldview of the unrighteous, whether or not they are religious. Here and now, we are reminded that the choice is ours to make. We must choose to keep our awareness focused and mindful of God's will for us, of his commandments, and of his eternal purpose. 
He gives us his covenant of peace, one of the pillars of our final redemption. The covenant of shalom is exemplified in the Shabbat, which was the first in the thought of God and the last day in his creation. In the Olam Haba, the world to come, the covenant of peace will find fulfillment when we have the comfort of God's eternal presence. Trust in Adonai forever, for Adonai is God, an everlasting rock. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, have we waited for you. To your name and to your memorial is the desire of our soul. With God, there is no such thing as finite time or space. Although our consciousness is limited by these confines, the future which God has planned for us already exists without any restrictions. In this way, we can understand transcendence which is the context of our bond with God. As Mashiach transcended time and space to be our propitiation, our atonement for sin. We read, he has swallowed up death forever. And the Lord God has wiped away the tear from off all faces and the reproach of his people he turned aside from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. In this context, we can understand and begin to assimilate our, our final redemption. We can begin to live beyond this earthly existence and its material attachments, addictions, obsessions, and patterns that keep us at a distance from God. These thoughts or activities which often take God's place in our lives or cause us to be stressed and anxious, full of concern. When we are united with God, all of these trivialities will be meaningless, as will the experience of pain and sorrow and death. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God for whom we waited, that he might redeem us. This is the Lord for whom we waited. We will be glad and rejoice in his redemption. That's right. Our present state should be one of waiting and longing to rejoice in God's presence as his redeemed people. Perhaps it may be that there are too many constraints tying you to this earthly existence. But the day will come for those who love God and are living according to his commandments when all these burdens will be gone and we will have nothing but joy in God's presence. As Yeshiahu declares, those yonder lift up their voices. They sing for joy. For the majesty of Adonai, they shout from the sea. Therefore, glorify the Lord in the regions of light, even the name of Adonai, the God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, even counsels of old, in faithfulness and truth. 
on this last day of Passover, we must consider how should we live. We should live in great anticipation of the day when we will be present with our Redeemer in the place of his sanctuary, Jerusalem, Zion, Israel. And in this mountain will the Lord of hosts make unto all peoples a feast, a feast of wine, of things full of marrow, of wines well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering that is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over all nations. In that day shall man see his maker, and his eyes shall see the Holy One of Israel. Just as God's absence is a curse, so God's presence will bring, ble will bring blessing, rejoicing, and peace beyond our imagination. The comprehensive blessings of our eternal state are sealed by God. He is faithful and true, and the perfection of our future is guaranteed by him. Our faith, our confidence, lies in his trustworthiness in the past, in who he is, in the experience of the prophets and eyewitnesses. God promises Mashiach's imminent return. This is our hope. He also promises to quickly reward the deeds of his servants. Everyone will receive his just deserts. The plagues of God are promised to those who add to God's word. While exclusion from the book of life is the end of those who take away from it. Surely, positively, he will come suddenly. Thus, on this, the final day of Passover, we are advised to be always prepared, always vigilant, always devoted and faithful, ready to welcome our King. God closes the revelation given through Rav Yochanan and his holy scriptures with a blessing, a blessing upon all who fear him, who believe and trust in him, and who are eagerly awaiting our eternal future. May this be your future. Shalom and blessings.